genius for life. Coconut smoothies coming at you. Hello, hello, welcome to episode one, two, three, one twenty-three of fifteen minutes of genius. It's kind of a cool number, right? Um, probably symbolizes something. Um, but uh, we bring on great entrepreneurs with really interesting products, different products. We bring on investors. We bring on advisors. We also are starting to bring on people that are not in the CPG space, um, you know, like, like general influencers on LinkedIn and TikTok and Instagram. So we're really trying to broaden our horizon beyond just CPG. But today we're going into hardcore into CPG with a CPG product here. But before I introduce him, big plug to Mark Nicholas, Mark and at ManhattanBeatStudios.net. For all your editing desires, he's the guy that can do editing for you for a photo, video. He is the king of the castle. He is the Oz behind the curtain. There's no curtain here, but I see him right here. He has the control panel here, the master switch, which can turn me off at any time. Hopefully he doesn't do that. We'll see where the show goes. All right, so again, make sure to reach out to him, Mark and at ManhattanBeatStudios.net. So our... Guest is I've actually never met him uh, either through video or uh, or virtually or even or you know or in person, but heard a lot about him. It's almost like I already know him from just meeting him through online. Matt Feldman, he is the founder and CEO of Moku Foods. A little bit about the company. It's basically a plant-based, savory, delicious snack, which is king oyster mushrooms in the form of jerky. A uh, little bit about. A little blurb here. They partnered with a renowned chef to turn king oyster mushrooms into a delicious jerky that anyone can enjoy from vegans or vegetarians to meat eaters alike. That's a big segment. Matt, how's it going, man? Good to be here, Alex. Thanks Absolutely. for having me. Absolutely, man. Yeah, I know you're in between different meetings. You're leaving on a red eye tonight uh, from Atlanta, and all these things are going on at the same time. So I appreciate uh, you're the last – thing that uh, you're going to do this interview before you board and start getting in crazy and getting all these meetings going and, and visiting par- yeah, uh, places in right. the country. Yeah. All right. Before I mumble off into something weird, let's talk about you. So uh, tell us about your story. So um, it's, it's a category, right? That's growing. Uh, you know, um, jerky mushroom, it's, it kind of feels like like uh, like actual jerky, but it's made out of mushrooms. There's a couple other brands doing this, like Pans. There's banana jerky. Where where is the where is the category going? How big can this category yet can it get? Um, just tell us more about your thought process and why you launched into this um, type of product. Yeah, so I went vegan in 2017, and I was looking for you know a nutritious, savory snack, and I went to the Whole Foods, farmers markets, Costco's, and all I could really find was, you know, nuts and, and chips and popcorn for savory. And I couldn't find like a good meat alternative snack, a good vegan jerky. So I started making mushroom jerky more just for fun. I was living in San Francisco working in tech at the time. And I sampled it out to a bunch of family and friends. I was literally just slicing portobello mushrooms, marinating them overnight and then dehydrating them. And people liked them. So I got some good validation there and I did some more research on the category. And I saw that beef jerky and meat snacks were approaching about $4 billion in the U.S. And um, the vegan subset was doing next to nothing. So I was like, wow, there must be an opportunity here. And I started to look at these other meat alternative categories like burgers and, uh, you know, cheese and cream cheese and things like that. And the the animal alternatives were approaching like 10% of the animal counterpart. So... I saw that there was a huge, you know, opportunity for vegan jerky. Um, you know, if the meat, you know, sector was approaching four billion, then you know, there, that means there was a huge opportunity for, you know, around five hundred million dollars for a vegan jerky category, which was next to nothing. So, it was a combination of me, you know, getting good validation from people, you know, in the community who were vegans, you know, flexitarians, people who, you know, kind of shift between plant based and and meat, um, and then that validation combined with um, you know, category Greenfield, uh, led me to quit my job and just go all in. Very cool. So it's, uh, it was, <clears throat> it's a leap of faith. <clears throat> Let's do that again, Mark, cause I lost my voice as you can see under the weather. <clears throat> 
it's a leap of faith, you know, getting into a new category. Um, it's young. It's a challenger to what's been around for many, many, many years, which is beef jerky. Um, how confident are you that someone who eats beef jerky will cross over, similar to someone eating meat, like a, like a patty going to Beyond Meat? How confident are you that someone eating beef jerky can go over and eat yours and get a similar experience? Uh, do you have any insider data on that, that type of customer? So I know that for Beyond Meat, the majority of their customers are not vegans, which I think is a good sign. Um, but it really depends on why they're going to eat the meat alternative, right? Because if it's if it's for health reasons, then they're probably not going to eat Beyond Meat due to the long label and chemicals and all that. Um, but if it's for you know the planet, then they're going to shift. And I think for me talking to you know people who eat meat. They're like, if something tastes good and it's clean, I'll definitely shift to it, but it has to taste good. So for us, we worked with, you know, two chefs early on to dial in the, the taste and texture as much like meat as possible. It's not a, an exact replica of meat. This isn't like a product made in a lab, but it's close enough where both the vegan side and the, you know, flexitarian and meat eater side can still enjoy it. Um, and I think as more data comes out and, you know, as like climate change gets worse, unfortunately, um, people are going to have to start shifting to, you know, healthier foods for the planet, not just for their bodies. So when I started the company, I wanted to make sure that one, it was something that I would eat. So it was a clean label, something I was comfortable putting in my body, but also something that is good for the planet. And I think over time, um, there's just going to be a higher need for to, to eat, you know, foods that are good for our planet. So I think it's going to keep going up. Um, the lab based and the, you know, high, you know, long label meat alternatives that I don't have as much faith in just because I think people are starting to look at the label um, similar to probably you, Alex, and how you have a very clean label for your smoothie, like the Adwalas of the world, like th those won't always work, I think. Exactly. <clears throat> I think that consumers are becoming smarter and smarter and more educated. And it's mm -hmm. also about going where consumers understand your product, you know, where they're going to see mm -hmm. the value in it versus another beef jerky that could be um, lesser cost versus yours, which is much cleaner mm -hmm. and, and, and better. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really, it's, it's one of these things. And, you know, question I have for you is you talk about being better, you know, for the planet. And, and one other thing too, I'll agree with you. Beyond Meat is having a lot of issues right now, a ton of issues. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you, I'm sure you are being in business, you follow their stock. I mean, it's plummeted more than yeah. 70% in the last year because the hype I believe the hype is over for just mm -hmm. for the Beyond Meat type products, which are really yeah. not good for you. Like just being mm -hmm. vegetarian is not enough to get someone yeah. to buy it. So, uh, yeah, so that was a side note. But getting into mm -hmm. just uh, the product itself and good for the planet, how are you communicating this to the customer, right? It's on a shelf. It's, it's vegan. It has to taste good. It's different, a little bit weird. It's different. Um, how yeah. are you communicating that? on your website, social media, because that's going to get people to buy more. So what's your strategy there? Yeah, there's a lot of different ways we do it, and there's still more ways that we should be doing it. But um, on our website, we have, you know, a page on the sustainability, on the product page and our homepage. Um, if you turn the back of the bag um, around, there's a section on, you know, comparing one bag of Mokuki and the amount of water, land, and CO2 emissions that you're saving. Right. Uh, and when someone receives a package um, of Moku, there's a insert card, which also shows the environmental impact. Um, but we, we still want to do like more videos. And the thing about like our product is health is so subjective that like we don't want that to be the the face of why you should eat Moku. Instead, we're, it, the label is clean, but instead the argument about how it's better for the earth is much easier. Um, and it's, no one will argue that, you know, moku mushroom jerky is better for the planet than beef jerky. So that's kind of our main, um, marketing ploy, I would say. Yeah. I think it's getting to the customer, you know, a why, right? It's a very kind of cliched statement, Simon Sinek and why, and the power of why that mm -hmm. consumers are going to go out of their way to buy this product because not only does it taste really good and nutritious, it's better for them, but they're also helping the planet. So it's a win-win. So the category, um, you know, going back into, I think, how big you can get this. What's your strategy for distribution? Um, again, you know, 
there's a lot of brands that I've noticed that are challenger brands, right? Just like yours. You're challenging this huge, I think you said five, five billion dollar category. Four, four to five billion, yeah. Four, four to five billion. So you're challenging this. And do you want to stick with more of the Whole Foods and Sprouts? Do you feel that this can go into a Kroger and a Safeway, Target? Like, what's kind of the, what's the endurance of this kind of brand going into conventional, which is hard to cross over with a Challenger brand? So what's, uh, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I actually think this will do better in conventional and alternative retailers like, you know, 7-Elevens and gas stations. But Interesting. we need to get the brand image out. Um, and that'll take, I think a year or two at least. So we started, you know, earlier this year, 2021, and we only sell our product online, um, a couple different channels online, but we want to understand who our consumer is, where it's selling best and leverage that into then into the natural retailers next year. Um, and then from there into these alternative retailers and some of these larger conventional retailers, but, um, I mean, in natural, there's going to be a lot more competition, whereas like a 7-Eleven, it'll probably be the only plant-based jerky there. So those are the areas that we want to play in eventually. And the markets, I think, is way bigger for a product like this and some other products that we're working on in the category. But we're going to start with natural. Um, and then once the brand, you know, awareness, you know, goes up, then we'll eventually launch into the other channels. Yeah, it definitely is a smart choice. And uh Going exclusively online, um, especially during the pandemic, obviously a, a great choice, light shipping, easy to, you know, mm -hmm. affordable to ship. Um, you, can, you can maintain a great price point online with your type of product. Um, mm -hmm. one, one retailer or chain that just comes to mind, like a freight train is Starbucks to me. Mm -hmm. Like I know it's everyone wants to be in there, but I see this as a perfect fit, like for a Starbucks, yeah. like being in those baskets. So, um, are, are you, have you approached anyone there yet? Or are you trying to get to Howard Schultz? Um, have you, have you made any contact at all with home base Starbucks? I haven't. And that I was thinking the same thing as you a year ago when we were launching, I was like, if we can do an exclusive launch with Starbucks, I would do it as the only retailer. Um, haven't, I haven't even reached out just because we're still like focused on, on online only. And I want to dial some more things in before we, so that we were buttoned up before approaching right. a Starbucks. But right. I, I don't know who the right person is there, but I do believe that they would be a great fit. I don't know how many new brands they're working with anymore. Um, I don't see as many like up and coming right. startup brands yeah. as I used to, but I agree. It would be a great, great channel. Yeah. Um, just uh, something uh, more of like a tip just for anyone watching and for yourself. There's actually um, a Howard Schultz Venture Fund. Yeah. So, and uh, a lot of people don't know that, that Howard Schultz just formed it, you know, because he's basically a billionaire and uh, they invest in early stage brands. I don't know if they invest and then put the brands into Starbucks. I don't know the details, but just something, something sounds like you're aware of it. Anyone watching, yeah. if you're, you're a small brand, you want to be in Starbucks, you know, start with the venture fund. So right. um, anything else you want to share with us about, because uh, we're running out of time here about the, the story, about... Um, about new innovations? Are you going to stick with, is it going to be like a mushroom brand across and doing different mushroom innovations? Or are you going to stick just with jerky? So we're going to, our, our next product that we're launching is also in like the meat snack category. Interesting. And we want to use mushrooms in all of our products in some way. It could right. be functional mushrooms. It could be, you know, the edible mushrooms. But um, I think that's a core, you know, principle of our brand. But at the end of the, at the, end of the day, we want to make delicious food that, is good for the planet and kind of bridge that gap of, you know, food that vegans can eat and foods that meat eaters can eat and make it easier for those meat eaters to shift without compromising on, you know, price, taste, uh, label or sustainability. So, um, we're, st we're sticking with the, the snack category now, but I would say like one interesting thing is like, like you said, we haven't met yet. I haven't even met my team. I met one person on my team. I haven't, I just started meeting investors because, I, st I launched a company during COVID and we, we, at this point we, we have about 15 investors and I've met maybe one or two in person when right. I would come to LA. Welcome to the new world, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it is, it has been cool just like starting a company from Hawaii, meeting all these people virtually like you, um, ha haven't even met my business partner and team, which is kind of crazy. It'll happen eventually, but 
it is possible to, you know, LinkedIn is such a powerful tool. Like I know you use it a lot, Alex, and mm -hmm. it's a great way, not only for marketing, obviously, but you can get in front of everyone. Um, you have to be very strategic in your messaging and make sure you stand out because a lot of these people um, get messages from a lot of folks. But, you know, if you're, especially if you're young, hungry and asking for someone's uh, time, 10 minutes to pick their brain on stuff, like you'd be surprised how many people are willing to chat. Like when I first started, I, I reached out to founders like yourself, Alex, um, and I just asked for 10 minutes of their time. And so many, you know, accepted that first phone call and those led to investor intros and founder intros. And it allowed me to, you know, our first check came from Casper Mattress, the founder and Thrive Market. And just getting those two as first investors, those, mm -hmm. those led to so many other investors wanted to come in. And I didn't know anyone in the food industry, but I was hungry and like, I knew how to use LinkedIn. So if there's anyone that's like in a foreign place, um, that's not close to people in person, like it doesn't mean you can't reach out and make these connections. Exactly. Um, I think it's a very, very well said. And, um, just for anyone out there, <clears throat> LinkedIn is a very strong tool. And when you reach out, if you're a founder, entrepreneur, reaching out to another entrepreneur, um, there's a lot of empathy, not about like empathy, like we feel what you're going through. We know that it's hard. It's not easy. And we want to lend a hand, right? I've reached out to entrepreneurs helping me that are way further along than me. And then I've um, had people reach out to me where I'm further along than them. So it's mm -hmm. like this great kind of synergistic platform on LinkedIn that really help each other for the common goal for all of us to win and succeed. Mm -hmm. that, that's a great thing about the platform. Yeah. Yeah. So let's get into our next segment, which is called Rapid Fire Questions. Rapid Fire Questions. All right. So uh, before you uh, drift off to sleep on a red-eye flight, one more exciting thing, this might actually keep you up on the flight, are all these questions. And we're going to put you on the hot seat here. But it's not too bad. Um, depends on the person. But I think you're, you'll are you ace these. So here we go, question by question. Um, one minute or less. Let's answer them all as quickly as we can. First question. For music, which decade is the best? The 70s, 80s, or 90s? 80s. What do you do for exercise? Surf, basketball, gym. Right on. Movie you can watch an unlimited amount of times. I usually don't watch movies over again, but The Count of Monte Cristo, I love that movie, and I've watched it multiple times. I remember seeing that in college, yeah, where they, they're on this, like, this big field coming at each other, right? Like the, yeah. the huge moment in the movie. All right, uh, chocolate or vanilla? Vanilla. Favorite country to travel to? Costa Rica. Yeah, I was going to say Hawaii seems like a country out there. <laughs> yeah. It's like so different. All right. Uh, I can't believe it's part of the U.S. It's just like radically so different and far away. Um, a, lot, a lot don't want it to be part of the U.S. I'm right there with you. Uh, <laughs> freedom. All right. Um, favorite Star Wars characters? Don't hate me, but I've never seen Star Wars. I don't hate you, but I feel sorry for you. <laughs> Next question. What is your spirit animal? Turtle. Turtle. I love that. It's a very Hawaiian, right? A lot of turtles in Hawaii. Yeah. Right? Honu. Yeah. Yeah. Calm, you know, hard shell, graceful, very smart, slow and steady yeah. wins the race, even though you're moving pretty quick for a turtle. Yeah. All right. So uh, do you like to drive an SUV, a coupe, or a truck? SUV. For food, I think this is an obvious I know what this answer is, but salty or sweet? Salty. Doesn't take a genius to know that you answer that one. Favorite day of the week and why? I would say Friday because even though we work all the time as founders, um, just has that energy where you know you'll have some free time over the weekend and people still you know, want to do stuff Friday evening. Right on. And then uh, LeBron James, Michael Jordan, or Kobe, the uh, greatest of all time. I didn't get to watch too much of Jordan, but um, I would say Jordan. Yeah, agreed. Love Kobe. 
Love Kobe. I think he's yeah. he's he's definitely up there as number two or three. Probably yeah. number two at this point. Terminator mm-hmm. two, term actually Terminator one or Terminator two. I can barely remember them, but I, I think Terminator one. Got it. Everyone's been answering Terminator one like the last like four interviews. Um, it's, it's like so a weird. It's like it's, it's like an energy, right? Like the first ten people answer Terminator two, and then suddenly four <laughs> people answer Terminator one. <laughs> Yeah, it's a it's a good movie. I, I enjoy it. Uh, favorite yeah. food or drink if you're stuck on a desert, deserted island and you cannot say Moku, you cannot say Genius Juice. Oh man, um, avocado. That's a good one. Avocado, <laughs> healthy and delicious. There you go. <laughs> well, that that is rapid fire questions with Matt Feldman. Founder CEO of Moku Foods. Awesome king oyster mushroom, delectable, delicious snacks, jerky. They're amazing. So Moku Foods, M-O-K-U foods.com, right? Yeah. Is it on Amazon or just your website or both? Is it on both? Website, Amazon, Thrive Market. Right on, man. And of course, you have the investment from someone at Thrive Market, one of the co-founders, you said. So yeah, that's a natural shoe in right there. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Right on, man. Well, thanks for joining us in episode one, two, three. Have a safe flight. Um, good luck on all your business meetings. And great to finally meet you, man. And congrats on everything. Yeah. Thanks so much, Alex. It's great to be here and look forward to meeting you in person. Likewise. Expo West, baby. We'll be there. All right. So that is episode one, two, three of 15 Minutes of Genius. Big plug to Mark Nicholas, Mark N, and Manhattanbeatstudios.net for all your editing desires for photo video uh you know want to do your own podcast this guy in the plaid shirt over here winter clothes and all he does it all um no camera on him but he's there there's someone here all right so uh again um thank you to matt fellman for joining us and sharing his story one last thing stay jerky and genius my friends genius for life Coconut smoothies coming at you.